Okay, welcome to um, tonight's online recorded workshop. The topic is boards and strategic thinking. It is uh, part of the C-Build program, and um, my name is Mark Goring. With me tonight as a co-presenter is Todd Wallace. Todd is a um, member of our CDS Consulting Co-op C-Build team and also the board president at People's Food Co-op in Portland, Oregon. Todd, will you say howdy? Hello, everyone. I am super excited to be a member of the C-Build team and super excited to be talking today about our topic. The fun oh. topic. Thanks. And um, we have Bentley Lean in La Crosse, Wisconsin, who, with Joel Brock, who's in Portland, Oregon, will be fielding your written questions and comments um, and, and integrating those into the presentation. So um, please take full advantage of the written interface. And um, Bentley and Joel will be channeling those in to us. So um, we're going to get started. A quick info motion on the C-Build program. Uh, C-Build stands for Cooperative Board Leadership Development. Uh, it is a program of the CDS Consulting Co-op that provides uh, ongoing support for boards of directors of food co-ops across the country. A uh, quick rundown of the different features of the program. We develop and deliver board development resources like this workshop. Uh, we are storing them in what we call the Seabuild Library, and the address will be in the slide deck if you... Um, haven't been there, and also this uh, this link is a good place to go for general information about the program, especially about C-Build 2010, uh, which that information has just been uh, recently released. Um, something new that we're starting up for next year, it'll be available later this year, is the C-Build GM compensation database that will allow GMs across the country to feed in their info and extract out summarized uh, comparable data. Pretty excited about that. We do um, uh, nine in-person multi-co-op trainings. Uh, we think of them as foundations, cl uh, foundations class. Primarily, they're for newly, directed, newly elected directors, but um, directors of all uh, levels uh, or time on boards have come and really enjoyed. And also, um, even managers have come and say they've appreciated it as well. We plan and facilitate a retreat, and we provide hours of consulting time throughout the year. Uh, here's an address. That's my email address. Feel free to be in touch if you want more info. Special thanks to Donna from Blooming Foods, who um, gave us one of the quotes that we used in our brochure. Here's our um, uh, little headshots of our Seabill team. Three of us are on the call today, uh, Mark and Bentley and Todd. Those are us. Everybody wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an article that was in Club Grocer Magazine, uh, the September-October issue, uh, titled Thinking Strategically by a member of our team, Marshall Kovitz. We're going to be excerpting um, from that article a little bit tonight. And um, it's really pretty terrific. goes into a um, uh, nice level of detail on Brett Fairbairn's three strategic concepts, linkage, transparency, and cognition. So um, we are going to pull some things out of it. Really highly recommend it as a, as a, a read. It's maybe, you know, three pages. Uh, in the next issue, another member of our team, Thane Joyal, has an article on asking powerful questions, and um, that one is also very much related to the information that we're talking about tonight. So here's the structure that we're going to use, boards and strategic thinking. Why, what, how, and when. Uh, for each of these, we're going to um, kind of frame the answers to some of these questions and uh, do a little bit of storytelling 
on um, and give some examples of how we've seen it uh, out there in, the, in, in food crops. In particular, I've asked Todd to share um, the, some of the, the story of the People's Food Co-op as it relates to this work. So that's going to be our kind of our primary example tonight. So to get started, why work on strategic thinking? So this guy, Brett Fairbairn, who's an, um, I think now he's, he has a, a chair, um, oh boy, I'm not going to, uh, Bentley or, or Todd, I've, I've forgotten the university. Um, Bob Noble, you're on the, on the call. Can you write in the university in Canada where Brett Fairbairn is, um, uh, is doing his thing? That would be awesome. Um, anyway, he has this 20-page uh, booklet, Three Strategic Concepts and, and um, Linkage, Transparency, and Cognition. And what he basically lays out in his booklet is um, that co-ops need to be thinking all the time as an organization that they need to be what we might call learning organizations. And uh, so he has you know, cognition as one of his strategic concepts. And here's three reasons why I think he's, he's saying this is really smart. One is that you know, change is going to happen, and, um, uh, and we should be aware of it as a, a conscious process, um, that paying attention to how co-ops think leads to additional insights kind of might take you to a place that you didn't expect. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, so Brett Fairbairn is at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, and you can Google um, three strategic concepts and get his whole booklet. It's really a terrific read. And then the last thing that he's uh, suggesting is that, look, we don't know what's going to happen. So the best we can do is just to really be aware and open and have a mental model for how to think about the future. So. Here's you know three reasons why um, boards and strategic thinking are um, a good match. In Marshall's article, he kind of builds on what Fairbairn's talking about and describes this idea of an organizational culture that's based on strategic thinking that is what brings us together, that helps create a sense of purpose and, uh, and community. And uh, I think that's just really a strong idea. And boards are in a leadership position to create this leadership, this organizational culture. You can really make a difference in this area. And then finally, um, Marshall suggests that it's worth taking this approach just to create a deeper understanding and to grasp how our world is changing. And what Fairbairn talks about is that since the world is changing and the co-ops are kind of moving through time as this you know, large collection of members who themselves have changing needs in this changing world, that you know, the better that we can just you know, be open to understanding that at the deepest possible level, the more informed our leadership position is going to be in moving the co-op forward. So that really is you know, the, 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 the theoretical um, foundation for why boards would take up strategic thinking and how it might add value. We use this picture to demonstrate that uh, the, the lower circle is all about delegation and accountability of having policies and having management, um, you know, be responsible and accountable for all that goes on in the co-op, all the programs and activities. And once this is functioning, it really provides the freedom for the board to really become free and empowered to take on the strategic thinking work. So the common ground is that the board's product ultimately is policy. But what uh, Fairbairn and, and Marshall and, and, and our work is really suggesting is that uh, it's worth having the board focus on this very basic idea of building wisdom and knowledge in order to provide leadership. There's this great quote um, in the lower right-hand section of the screen now that's in John Carver's book, Boards That Make a Difference. 
that when leaders are learning and growing, everything about them communicates the same opportunity to other people. They're excited. They do things differently. One of the most profound and unusual experience people can have on the job is to see their leaders grow. And this is another reason that we think it's worth boards taking this uh, position of building wisdom and knowledge and thinking about stuff is because it actually is inspiring to others. This is a crazy picture. <laughs> Just kind of <laughs> have it up here on the screen for a minute. I draw this out on flip charts when, when we're teaching this in person. Um, it's kind of a stratification of, of um, uh, activity and trends. And, and um, the red up at the top is, is meant to kind of demonstrate stuff that's going on in the world and impacting member owners and just, you know, life, internal, external, as it relates to our members. The green line is meant to show kind of a relatively low change of, of, of frequency, a low kind of dynamic pattern of change as it relates to owners' expectations expressed by the board about what they expect from the cooperative, the benefit and value produced by the cooperative. So, you know, one example is if we think of here on the left, if that was 30 years ago when food co-ops were forming and it was all about, you know, access to bulgur or, or you know, a, a bag of, of some grain that you just couldn't get anywhere. And here we are, you know, 30 years later, and it's about, you know, access maybe to local and regional food or the well-being of community centered on, on, on nutrition and health. And so over this long time, there hasn't been, you know, dramatic change actually in that benefit that the co-op is providing. And yet underneath that expectation, there's been tremendous change in the food industry and how food is grown and shipped around and the nature of our businesses and all that stuff. So um, it's just this idea that this might actually be a rather calm line uh, on top of all the stuff that's going on. So that's one way to look at this. Another way um, is to see how bright and exciting the yellow boxes are. New programs, a new building, a farm, more cooking classes, a recession sale, more stuff that's really neat. <laughs> I mean, this is all really attractive and could draw us in. But the question is, What's going on up here in the red zone, up here where all this stuff is that's affecting our members? What if we weren't actually focused on these things that are highlighted in yellow? Because, in fact, they're below this dotted blue line, which is the governance position marking where the board has delegated to management. If we, if we come up here, I mean, right now, there's, it's amazing. Um, I mean, this is, this is, there's so much going on that's affecting our members. And the question is, is there anything up here that we should be learning about? Why would we? Well, Fair Baron is saying, and Marshall in his article is saying, hmm, the better we understand what's going on with our members, the better that we can think about what it is that our organization is, is providing as a, as a benefit. So um, we'll, we'll pause at that now, and I want to um, shift over and hear uh, Todd's voice for a while and, and um, ask him why the board at the People's Food Co-op in Portland has been working on the strategic thinking stuff. Okay, great. Um, and thanks, Mark, for those, uh, those really cool um, uh, slides. Uh, I like those a lot. Um, so when we began our strategic thinking process, I mean, and I want to say that it's been going on now for uh, almost a couple years. Um, there were some transformational things going on at our co-op, on our board. Um, one, we're experiencing uh, growth, uh, quite a bit of it. And so there were these questions about um, leadership in relation to that. Also, um, the board itself had made a transformation or was in the process of making a transformation um, to a policy governance mode of of operating. So 
these two things were going on, and the board knew that it wanted to make some changes in the way um, that it, it, it leads, in the way that we're leading. Um, and basically, when I say changes, um, we wanted to start taking a long view approach um, to our call and its development. Uh, we wanted to really seriously consider our club's relevance uh, to our community. We wanted to be actively engaged with our member owners as a board. And um, really importantly, we wanted to do work that was intellectually and emotionally satisfying um, as a board, uh, which sounds like, you know, should be obvious that or to do this, uh, and I can tell you for that point and for all the previous points, I would have to say that as a board we weren't doing those things, which is a really big deal. Um, to me, I mean, those things are incredibly important to good leadership. Um, so that is the place we were in, and that is. Um, well, those are the things, some of the things that we're thinking about as we began to uh, enter this, this uh, way of doing and thinking about our work. So to, to recap, you're really um, thinking about your governance uh, position, your governance system, taking that seriously, and taking a long view. Yes. Right? Those two things are the big, uh, the, those two things together kind of led you in this, uh, in this direction. Absolutely. All right, so so um, now we're going to go into what, and um, you know the great thing about what is it starts to add uh, substance to the theory. So um, oh, and and uh, Todd Wallace, uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, Todd is from the People's uh, Food Co-op in uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, a member of our Seabuild uh, uh, consulting team. So. Um, uh, what? What does this look like? So the sub-questions on that would be, well, what would we think about and how would we decide? Um, in Marshall's article, he has this line, in order to gain the trust of owners, because Fairbairn really talks about this idea of co-ops being the, a trusted agent that's really acting on behalf of, 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 the, of the owners. So in order to gain that trust, the co-op must also provide information to owners about the larger world how that world impacts owners, and what the co-op's response is. And in the article, Marshall lays out this great example of, you know, it might be worth uh, food co-ops taking a leadership position in uh, understanding what's going on with agriculture, how that affects the economy, the environment, and our health, and, you know, really take a, a position. And, and I think, you know, what we're talking about is um, uh, that a board of, you know, seven or eight or nine or 11 people might have a, um, you know, casual relationship to that information. But what if you were really going to dig into it? What if you really said, we should be experts in that? How would that ripple out and change the, the, the cooperative and the community if you really knew, um, you know, solid information in the types of things here that Marshall is, uh, is talking about? So one tool that we, um, you know, it's really simple, but uh, we use a worksheet. And um, uh, it asks, hey, what are the topics, trends, and values that are, um, that are affecting members? So again, thinking back upstream here to the, these, all the stuff up here, you know, how do we name the things that are going on up there that are affecting our members? And, um, and if we were to think about some of those things as, as trends, so topics kind of in a, in, a, in a time continuum, what would we call them? So that's this first idea. Let's just label some things. And then the next question is, well, can we start to design kind of an inquiry process that would move our, our process forward? And just using the question as a tool for that can be incredibly kind of clarifying and powerful. We've uh, really been using this uh, reading The Art of Powerful Questions as a terrific resource in that. It's available 
at the worldcafe.com website, which is a fantastic resource focused on you know, community change based on small group conversation, which is very much like um, what happens at the board, at the board level. You start a conversation, nine or 11 people, you start to tell the story, it ripples out. So um, the worksheet is, can we name the topic trends and values? Can we frame compelling question that's going to help move this thing forward? Can we imagine resources? Can we, can we point to some things? Is there a book? Is there a person? Should we go on a field trip that will help you know, move this thing forward? Uh, next, is there a way that we can do this not just as a board? Could we involve other people? So this might be other people in your community who might share the same topic. Eventually, it might mean rolling out your learning into the membership community and the community at large. And then this last question is one that we've just added. Um, we have this worksheet embedded in our enrollment process for CBUILD 2010. We're collecting this nationally because our hunch is that we could build um, uh, a sense of what these topics and trends and values are across the country and start to address them together instead of in isolation, one co-op at a time. So we're also in our input and enrollment form asking, hey, this is great. You made it this far across the little columns. Do you think this has relevance regionally or nationally and why? So when you get ready to fill out your enrollment form, uh, have, have this information. And we're going to keep kind of uh, uh, pushing this and, and processing it together so that we can share it back out to you um, uh, later. So um, I'll ask Todd to, to uh, tell their story. Up on the screen right now, I uh, included, or we included the uh, ENDS policies from, from that co-op. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so Todd, what, um, what have you been sure. doing with this? So for the what, um, for us, we started with our end statement, um, which made sense at the time because um, it, was, it, it is uh, and it was fresh for us. Um, we had just finished crafting it. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on it. And so um, the relevance um, of it uh, was in the forefront of our minds. Um, and so we looked at it. And we did this at retreat. And uh, we figured out that we liked it. And that there were some things there that we would be curious about uh, learning more about. Um, or, or I would even say, uh, in, the tr in the case of a topic we picked, that we really knew very little about. Um, and so we picked up three things that we, that we drew out of there. Um, we, the uh, subject of cooperative economies, uh, community, uh, specifically connections within the community, and um, helpful food access, uh, which I think is a common thing in a lot of uh, co-ops. Uh, like to think about and learn about. Um, and we ended up picking the cooperative economies as um, an overall topic that we thought would be fun to explore and also relevant. Um, it's important to say that we wanted something that was relevant to both ourselves and our member owners. And so we took that and we kind of picked it up with the attitude of being curious and wanting to learn. Right. What are cooperative economies? Right. And and I see you have the uh, questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The so again, not knowing a lot about the subject, um, it was natural for us to do kind of an inquiry. What are they? Basically, what do they look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so what happened was uh, for our study schedule, um, it, it began to look like really a survey of these uh, things. Um, as time went on and we explored uh, that question and learned more about it, further questions um, developed. And I think with good questions, that's always what happens. And so you have these um, uh, other questions that pop up. Um, what distinguishes cooperative economies? Uh, what is people's co-ops place in relation to larger history and culture of cooperation. 
Um, that's one thing that has, that's one question that's resurfaced over time. Uh, what is our cost place in relation to the mainstream, the mainstream economic landscape? Uh, and of course, that landscape is something that is uh, incredibly relevant to our member owners right now. Um, what is really possible uh, for us and for our community in relation to cooperation? Um, what are the benefits and limits? Uh, of such uh, an economy for our community. So this is an example of, of some of the percolating questions that have come up. Nice. Cool. And when we get to how, you can uh, share with us kind of what that what that looked like. Sure. All right. We have a couple other examples of the what. Um, this uh, I pulled out of the the, the history book um, around 2003. When I was on the board of the Brattleboro Food Co-op, um, there were uh, some study guides produced for um, uh, uh, co-ops in the east. And two of the topics were um, collaboration and co-op values and principles. And these were some of the questions that came up um, in, in, those, uh, in those study packets. You know, what are the benefits of collaborating? Uh, this question I remember was also, this next one was, was um, uh, part of a Cooperative Grocer magazine article by Marilyn Scholl. Could our co-op survive and thrive if we were the only food co-op in the country? For how long? And this was at a time in 2003 when um, the regional co-op grocers associations were about to uh, fold into the um, NCGA, the National Co-op Grocers Association. So these were very, um, really thought-provoking questions that our board, or the Brattleboro Food Co-op Board, grappled with uh, during those times. You know, what does it really mean to cooperate among cooperatives? Jumping a little bit ahead to the how, because I, I don't have this uh, slide coming back. Each of these uh, um, study guides came with uh, one to three related uh, articles. Um, a background summary of the topic and trend, and these questions. So the the directors received in their in their packet for the board meeting, you know, some really good stuff to um, help them prepare for um, thoughtful conversation around these questions. So this one around collaboration, and then even more fundamentally, um, co-op values and principles. Why are we organized as a co-op? How does the statement of cooperative, of cooperative identity uh, relate to us? Um, you know, how do cooperatives influence people's lives? I mean, really fundamental questions that I think uh, a certain level we could take for granted, and yet I think it is worth, you know, looking around the table every now and then and saying, hey, do we really, are we really tuned in to the power of what it means to be a co-op? Right? How can we use the cooperative difference as a competitive advantage? What could that possibly mean? And if you roll that back to what Fairbairn and Marshall are saying in the articles, it's like it's everything. Because we actually want to be so tuned in to um, what's going on in, in, in the lives and uh, in the worlds of our members and the worlds that they're in, that uh, the co-op is, isn't a separate thing. It's actually that collection of people who are really working um, together to create something. So um, another what, in, in, in 2004, the Brattleboro Food Co-op, uh, part of our ENDS policies at that time was about sustainable community. And we really took that seriously in, in the inquiry process and, and um, had some people come in and, and help educate us about what that meant. And that kind of led to this whole idea of the, a regenerative marketplace and the idea that you could have a community of people um, working together and, and not using resources, not not um, not pulling resources from the from the planet, and but actually uh, producing resources uh, together as as a group, and um, and it was interesting because that coming after this this earlier study of co-ops and collaboration really led to some interesting work now that's happening, you know, five and six years later. Um, that really, you know, you can look at the, the, the roots of some of the things that are going on, very exciting things that are going on. The Brattleboro Food Club go back at least this far, and of course you could, you know, open up the history books probably of the 1990s and 1980s and see how the thread really goes back farther than that. 
but in terms of you know intentional, focused, strategic thinking done by the boards, uh, here were two examples of things that sustained themselves for four to six months each that really have had uh, lasting and significant impact uh, years later. Uh, one more example of what um, is uh, from the, the community of Mercantile in Lawrence, Kansas. I was doing a CBL 101 just a few weeks ago in uh, Minneapolis, and they sent two of their newly elected directors there. And uh, they have a very interesting thing going on in Lawrence where the the, the the town has said that has set goals for local and regional food production. So after years of the co-op being uh, leaders in uh, you know local and regional, and I remember I was there in 2004, I think, maybe 2005, and all throughout their produce department they had these maps of how far the food had traveled to get there. So they've been really ahead of the curve on that. And, and now that's actually mainstream because their town has said, hey, this is important to us. We're going to um, you know, organize for that. And now the co-op is having to rethink how does it uh, reset its relationships around the local, and local food system given that it's something that's being embraced by the wider community. So very fascinating time for them. Um, and so they're working on these very fundamental questions about um, how they interact with the food system. So um, um, Todd, you want to add to that? Um, that was good. Um, I think the good ex uh, example of community mercantile is key because of that relevance question. Um, again, going back to Fairbairn, um, that's something that we definitely need to um, ask ourselves from time to time. Why, you know, what, what, why is our organization relevant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or maybe all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go into let's go into the how. Um, we have uh, we we have or, or Bentley, do you have some questions there? Is this a good time to? Yeah, I'm just, I'm okay, just wondering, uh, in, kind of in my experience of boards, I've had two questions or issues come up around this idea of spending okay. time studying things. I'm wondering if you could react if you've had experience or how you've dealt with them. I've, I've dealt with one board that, that for some reason didn't feel they had permission to spend time uh, learning about things when they had so many um, uh, what they called board things to do. And uh, the other uh, question that came up is, boy, I got on this board to be on a board of directors, not to join a book club. Uh -huh. um, could, you, could you respond to that or talk about your experience? Well, have you ever had any uh, pushback from the group of any kind? Todd? Uh, sure. Um, I can talk about that. Um, so the answer is yes. And so let me say that when, I think when we started, we were really excited about doing this kind of work, um, starting out. So it, it wasn't like we didn't want to go there, basically, is what I'm saying. And yet, it, you know, there's a couple things. Um, there's an idea that, you know, if you're on a board, what you should be doing is um, just looking at financial reports all the time. Or, and, and if it's exciting and interesting, well, you're not actually doing board work. There's that thing, um, which uh, you know, even in our in our time when, when we wanted, we were we knew we wanted to go there, and we were you know, because it's it's interesting. Um, you know, I could still sense that there was this this question of, and then it, of course it relates to what we're going to talk about in a second, which is how, which is if you've never done this kind of work. Um, how do you do it? How much time do you spend doing it? How do you do that and balance the other things that you have to do as a director, which which we have we do have to do. I mean, there are other um, parts of our work, but I think we'll probably get into that more. So, absolutely, um, Bentley, uh, I, I you know I got that sense. Um, there there was a tension there. 
that we had to kind of work through and decide. Um, as we did it, and as we were very careful to think about the relevance and why we were doing it, um, I think a lot of those things kind of evaporated. Because the work itself was compelling. Yeah, good. Thanks, Todd. Um, so some of the ways that I think about that is that, first of all, time is a board's most precious resource. Think about it as a fixed, you know, it's a, it's a finite resource. It's not limitless. And so once you do that, then you have to start deciding, well, how are we going to use it? How are we going to use this precious resource? And where can we, or how can we use it so that it adds value? And um, so that's, that's kind of one threat, really, to pay attention to, you know, if we're going to talk about that for half an hour, let's make sure it's really the thing we want to talk about. Um, the next thing is that there's a lot of discipline involved in, in serving on a board, I think. And the example that, that I give in the CBL 101s relates to the governance position, which is all about, look, if we've delegated something, we're agreeing to not also do the work. And the example in the, that I like to give is that my mom said, hey, Mark, keep your room clean when I was a kid. And then she cleaned my room for me. So my room was always clean, but it wasn't really clear who was responsible. And so, you know, we would encourage a board, you don't need to try and be super manager. You've delegated management. Let that happen. You can add value in a different way that's unique to the, board, the board's level in the, in the organization. So, um, you know, I guess if the world wasn't changing <laughs> and <laughs> our members' needs weren't changing, then uh, thinking about stuff might not matter. But um, I would say that this is a really interesting time to be very aware of what's going on and to be thinking about it and asking questions and say, if we spend our, you know, 20 hours a year or however long we're going to, you know, commit to doing our role, that let's actually try and, and do it in a, in a highly leveraged manner. Now, there's a long list of things that boards have to do well in order to experience this, the freedom, you might say, of being in this position. And, um, and we're not going to go into how to do all those things well tonight, but we would say that um, that's why our program exists, to really help boards do a good job so that they can actually do something that's adding value and, and really you know, moving this whole uh, conversation forward. So at the same time, you know, we've got to do recruiting, and maybe we have to do bylaw review, and those things. And so the, the, you know, maybe the broadest idea in response is let's make sure that we're being very intentional about how we're using our time, and let's be able to reflect on how the board adds value, and let's not spend all of our time just uh, you know, being functional as a board. Let's try and do some of the, the thinking that is you know, the, the higher level stuff. Right? And then I think you, it takes group commitment to that. And you have to do training and have the resources on hand so that you can sustain that over time. So let's, um, let's check this how thing out. Um, so here were some, some, some ideas, some things that, that, uh, that you need to pay attention to to be successful in this. Um, pick a reasonable time frame. You only have so many hours a year uh, that, you, that you meet together and that directors are going to invest in their, in their role. So make sure that you have that in balance with what you're taking on. Um, assigning tasks and making sure that there's follow-up and making sure that presenters and facilitators are prepared and that participants are coming prepared really makes a big difference in the board meeting. So take that seriously. Hey, if we're going to get together, we're going to do this. Let's do it at a professional level. Let's let's really let's do this. Um, look for information outside of the people sitting around the, the table. Say who who could we invite in that would change the dynamic? That would bring in a new perspective, a new voice. Could we read a book? Could we watch a movie? Could we go somewhere? You know, think outside of the 
seven or nine or 11 people who are gathered together as directors. Um, this next one, remembering, is critical. And the, the simple test is, you know, look ahead five or 10 years and imagine that people who are serving on the board are different people than who are on the board now. How will they benefit from the work that you're doing? It's really a critical uh, thing that you know we have this iterative nature in our boards, and we need to make sure that, that we're building something and not just treading water. right? And then the last one is this idea of, of, of this is meant to uh, be an expanding circle. It's not really just about boards. You're leading, but the point is let's get it out into the membership and other stakeholders and the community as it's relevant. And I think, you know, you're, in a way, you're, you're testing and developing uh, in order to expand the circle so that, you know, you wait, wait till you're ready. But when you have something, you know, lay it out there and say, hey, we've been thinking about this. It's important. Here's the questions that we want to move forward in our community. So um, now I want to have Todd uh, describe some of their um, process at People's Portland on the how, how did you do stuff, Todd? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was that was good, Mark. Um, all those points, um, you know, are, are relevant to the process that we've had. Um, I would say that one thing that I wanted to just reiterate again um, for our how was um, the aspect of being good at framing your question or questions. Um, that was that's going to be key in making sure. I think that. Um, what you're pursuing is, is going to be relevant and going to lead to some uh, good uh, learning over time. Um, also, the point you made about being intentional uh, uh, are very important. Um, our, uh, being intentional with the schedule, um, that was key for us, having a schedule um, just so you know, we we could be we could begin to be organized about doing this work. Um, presentation, um, I would say, be open to different ways of presenting the information. Um, so in our case, um, we've had presentations on various topics, uh, with Q and A. We've shown films. Um, we've had guest speakers. Um, one of our most interesting uh, sessions was actually um, a public event. Uh, which relates to um, what you mentioned with Mark about expanding the circle. Um, it was a, really a member event in which David Thompson, the co-op historian, came in uh, and talked about and showed slides from his trip to Italy. And the subject was the Emilia-Romagna uh, cooperative model uh, that exists there in northern Italy. Um, that was a great talk. And luckily, it came early on in this work that we were doing so that uh, we filled the room. It was to happen in our community room. We filled the space. And members were really excited and engaged about the topic, which kind of surprised me, to be honest. Um, I, was, I didn't really expect the kind of uh, animation and energy um, that I saw there. And so that was a nice uh, clue that what we this subject was uh, an important and compelling one um, to people outside of our uh, boardroom. Um, but I mean, also um, you know, guest speakers to board meetings, discussions. Um, we've had some sessions that were uh, after digesting material were um, basically uh, debates or discussions around a particular question. For example, um, uh, the Emilia Romagna cooperative model and uh, the cooperative culture of Mondragon in Spain. Compare and contrast. Let's talk about it. Um, again, directors had some really interesting observations um, about those topics and were able to re actually relate um, those things to our co-op and the things our co-op was going through. Um, in terms of the how of engaging in this wider circle, which I think is a really important thing to talk about, um, I would say 
invite uh, members to your meetings um, to clue into what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, when I had to give uh, one of my presentations about the Rochdale Pioneers, I went to our farmers market and I talked it up to member owners that I knew, and just said, "Hey, come come to our meeting and come check out this talk. You might be you might find it interesting." And a lot of people came and really enjoyed it. Um, there's also, uh, like I said before, member events. We um, hook into this process at our annual meeting. Uh, and so, you know, different co-ops do different things to engage the membership. Some people do like World Cafe and other kind of presentations. Um, so at our last annual meeting, for example, um, we had members, uh, those members who were interested, uh, get together in small groups and ask these kind of questions about uh, cooperatives geared towards you know their knowledge and understanding and those times have been really successful um, people come to those and directors are orchestrating um, each small group in which that is happening um, so a director might sit down and, and give a little bit of information and then ask a question of hey you know what does uh, people look like uh, 50 years from now in this kind of thriving cooperative economy, what does it look like? What is what is important about it? What is neat about it? And uh, you know that was a way to hook members into this question. Um, also, engaging, uh, we write articles um, about our study topics. Um, after the topic is presented, somebody is uh, asked to write a reflection piece or an article um, that appears in our newsletter. And so that's another way that it gets out to the membership. The membership can see uh, that the board is thinking about these questions. Um, and then I wanted to say a couple uh, last things, Mark, about the how. Um, you talked about remembering. I think memory is key. Um, you have to be able to go back and look at this stuff, especially for the newer directors that come on. Um, so that there has to be a way that they can look through and, and, you know, for example, a collection of those articles uh, for the newsletters is a great way, you know, could be a great way for them to, to look through and, and have a sense of what the board has, uh, has uh, studied over time. And also, it's time for reflection. And so we, um, every few months or so, take a step back and actually, instead of actually just adding on another topic, take some time to reflect on what we've done. Um, what have we studied before? Um, the way, basically what we did, we've done it twice, um, once at retreat and once uh, in meeting. And basically what I did was I created a narrative of all the topics that we've done and tried to create a framework for how they related to each other and how they related to our larger question. Presented that to the board so that you get a sense of an overarching pattern um, or rhythm, and then start to ask questions. Hey, how does this look to people? Is this still relevant? Is this still compelling? Do we need to go further? Do we need to change the topic? Um, and then also in terms of our process, in terms of our how, uh, what could be improved upon? Um, what could be changed? For example, uh, you know, do we need to spend more time in our meetings going over this? Do, do we feel like we're not spending enough time? Um, do we need to maybe think about topics not on a monthly basis, uh, meaning a topic per month, but think about, hey, maybe this, we have some bigger topics you want to spend, you know, a longer time, maybe a couple sessions dealing with that one topic um, and change something that way. Uh, do we want more interaction between the board leaders or myself and individual directors in terms of preparation and, and assistance and suggestions uh, for things they might be interested in. So I mean, those are just some of the things that mm -hmm. we've dealt with in terms of the how. Cool. I'm going to show, Todd, I had your picture up. Uh, we'll talk about your timeline in a minute uh, yeah. while, you were, while you were talking about that. Um, we're going to touch on the win, and um, here's my, my general uh, comment is view this as regular board work, not extra board work, and uh, try for half of your
your meeting three quarters of the time. So if you meet for two hours, try for one hour, eight out of 12 meetings. If you meet for three hours, try for one and a half hours, eight out of 12 meetings. And uh, start to look at that longer pattern, like lay out a plan that is, you know, 18 months long and start to fit this work in and then say, okay, well, that means we have to do this other stuff in, you know, this other hour or this other hour and a half and, uh, and really, you know, make a time plan that way. Um, in that plan, look for how it interacts with member meetings and newsletter deadlines and your annual reports and all that stuff. Um, uh, Todd already talked about this idea of running the process, getting a feel for it, assessing, adjusting, and keep going. That's really important. Um, uh, plan that in. And then this other idea that, that this work will attract candidates is a way to um, uh, have a, a board recruitment process in place that is uh, secondary to your primary objective, which is to do the strategic thinking. But if you're uh, working on this level um, and talking about it, uh, it will be interesting to people. So uh, view it actually as a um, not so much a recruitment uh, activity, but an attraction activity. Um, so there's a, a couple of things. And, and we have a list here of, um, uh, Todd, I have up the, uh, the, the work plan. And um, maybe you could just, you know, talk through not so much in detail, but just to kind of give a shape and pattern of that. Uh, th so this is um, your your actual plan from January uh, to July '08. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Just a few months um, of our schedule. Um, a couple of things that are interesting, uh, Mark, uh, based on that schedule and, and what you mentioned with the win. You know, we started out. Uh, I think devoting about half an hour to 35 minutes in our meetings. Um, we have a two and a half hour long meeting. And very quickly, we found that that was not enough time to really um, do, you know, to really do something that was compelling. Um, especially as time went on and directors got better at. Uh, or obtained more more knowledge and uh, background on the subject matter, and wanted to be more interactive and discuss things. Um, that time was just it became and honestly it became ridiculous to do it. I mean it sounds like a long time, 30 minutes to spend on this, but but it was just not enough. Now we spend we're at a point where and we got you know we had to get good at our other stuff too. So now we're at a time where we spend about an hour in the meeting. Uh, doing this work. And I can tell you that um, with that hour, uh, it's, it's to the point where we could still go on, certainly. So it's not like uh, it's too much time. I mean, it's never too much time, actually. Um, but uh, uh, it's, 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 you know, not quite maybe enough time in the meeting. Uh, yeah. I think it leaves Todd, I think of a, a one-hour um, kind of, you know, building um, building a dialogue is probably the minimum, you know, that, but like <laughs> it's somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half. You know, it's like oh, after an hour and a half, you have to really make sure that that that, that you've you've got a uh, an effective, you know, plan for facilitating the process. Um, you know, but an hour, it's 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 if you're having someone present some material and. Uh, bat it around a bit. That I think of that kind of as a minimum. Though I actually, you know, work with some boards who are who are really, you know, pulling it off and sustaining, you know, the the 50 minute hour. Okay. <laughs> so you know. Um, well, so I'm, we're, we're working on that. We're yeah. working. On that. I like to see it longer. Mm -hmm. um, so these these two bolded. Uh, so in March and July, you had uh, you you took it out. So those are the two things that you described earlier. Definitely. Definitely. Nice. Um, and again, uh, those things were key in kind of getting a sense of is this important to anybody but ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and of course it was uh, very much so. I want to, Todd. I want to put up the picture of you um, that I took at your retreat, and you're talking about this timeline. 
and just kind of share the uh, what we did. You know, you prepared the timeline, and um, and what I recall is that we actually went through it twice. Um, once was to kind of share the overview. Yeah. Of of and this was this eighteen months. Is it that I have? That's what yeah, I said on the slide. Yeah, this was eighteen months. Yeah. I think so. So this was, you know, hey, let's 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 get a the scope, this this bigger time frame of the work that we've been doing, and then um, what happened was Todd went through each event. So you know, some of the things on the timeline were board meeting discussions. Some were member um, events. So there was, you know, just board and then other uh, expand the circle, and. People in the room uh, shared some of the things that they were carrying forward from that event. All right. And what I thought was fascinating about this, and why this remembering uh, thing is so critical, was that the farther um, back or the the earlier part of the timeline, there were fewer people present who had been there. Right. So maybe the very last thing on the timeline, everybody was there. But the first thing, maybe only a third of the people were there. And um, I thought that was that was a really um, you know those those are kind of a, the sharing of the collective um, uh, wisdom and knowledge uh, over time, uh, kind of being you know expanded out to people who weren't at some of these events by using this very simple timeline as a tool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's you hit the nail on the head there. Um, in fact, Eli in the picture who was on the right uh, at that time was basically a brand new board member. And probably hadn't been around for maybe the first three or four things, um, and actually commented um, after the first time uh, we drew this timeline that it was really important for him to get a sense of you know where we had been, what we had looked at, and, and you made the point, Mark, of talking about what came out of that, and I think we did go around the room as a board and talk about uh, what, like you say, what people were carrying forward. Um, also, in relation to the timeline, it was important for me because, again, we were, we were really focused on the month to month. And it was really, really important for me to take a step back just as a director and get a sense of the big picture, again, right. uh, what has been going on over time. And, again, fit it all, of course, it all fit, but for us to look at it within the framework of our larger question. Right. Right, of cooperative economies. Exactly. Right up there on the top of that timeline. Well, that's. I oh, think this was, this was a great. Yeah, I can actually see it in the picture. I think this was a great, um, uh, a, a great, very simple technique. And I would, you know, even want to have that in the boardroom. So when you were when you were having a meeting that was, you know, the 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 slice, um, people could see that uh, it was bigger. You know, that that it was part of this 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 larger story, right? Um, so that's. I think it's a really handy tool. Um, so let's see. We have some um, resources just to remind you that they exist. So number one, the slides from this workshop are in the Seabuild Library, and a recording of this workshop will be posted in the Seabuild Library uh, probably tomorrow. And we've uh, gotten really good at that thanks to um, Joel Brock, who's providing technical support for us. So it plays on all the formats, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of other, um, there's three other uh, related uh, recorded workshops. Um, one was from 2008, including members in the ENDS dialogue. Uh, some of the same content, but you know, again, just approached slightly differently. But if you're interested in kind of digging in deeper and hearing it, you know, told in a different way, uh, go for that one. Uh, Michael Healy and Bentley Lean and I did a session boards and member linkage. This was really talking about boards assuming leadership position, like we're talking about here, and having uh, the relationship with members follow from that leadership position, and not thinking of it the other way around. And, and the, the, it's a great workshop, I think. And, and my takeaway is that we're inherently linked. And what's critical is that the boards really assume the leadership position and start doing this thinking work, and then things follow from there. Uh, earlier this year, we had a session um, with Walden Swanson and, and several other people on governing uh, during recession. Really interesting uh, conversation, and it's really about leading and thinking about stuff uh, given these times. 
Marshall's article that we excerpted from. It's a great read. The one coming up in um, Co-op Grocer by Thane has some other examples from other co-ops uh, around the country. And we really encourage you, when you fill out your Seville 2010 form, to uh, put in your info. Or if you don't have it, you know, send it in later or whatever, because this is the first time that we're really intentionally collecting that level of governance uh, content um, nationally so that we can say, hey, look, you know, this uh, local economy thing is really on people's minds. Let's see how we can organize for that. Um, the Art of Powerful Questions, which is available on the worldcafe.com website, uh, is terrific. Uh, can't recommend it enough. So um, just checking in, uh, Bentley, um, any remaining questions that we should cover before we sign off? I, I think you pretty much summed up the questions. A lot of questions from people wondering uh, where they could get these resources. So they all know that yeah. yeah, they're available at the library. Great. And, and again, just want to, um, available in the library, and just want to go back to, uh, uh, let's, let's get our, our algebra right here. We're looking for half of your time at two-thirds of your meetings. Okay? Half of your time at two-thirds of your meetings. Make a plan Man. for that. Make a plan. All right? Does that sound good, Todd? That sounds wonderful. All right. Well, hey, um, let's call it quits. Thank you so much, Todd, for sharing your story at the People's Food Club. And thank you, Bentley and Joel, for, um, for helping out. Okay. All thank right. you, Mark and Todd. Right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Um, yep, and uh, all of you participants out there in the workshop, go for it. <laughs> Do it. Is there a, is there a evaluation following the? Uh, oh webinar? yeah, thanks. When we end the session, there will be a little survey that comes up, and um, and that you can also um, put in your uh, ideas for future workshops. The other thing about the C build form is we'll be asking for uh, your input on uh, resources that we should produce for you for next year. So make sure you give us 